All right. You all can help me out then. So, do you know the phrase green thumb? Have you ever heard of that before? What does it mean to have a green thumb? You're good at growing stuff. That's absolutely right. I don't know what the opposite is, but I think a majority of us would probably fall into that category. Let's just find out. How many of y'all out there have a green thumb? Anybody got a green thumb? How many of y'all don't have a green thumb? There you go. So that's why they create all... Yeah, you, did you look at mom and she says no? Yeah, uh, I love that. Yeah. So that's why they have plants like this. This plant right here I found out last night. This is called the mother-in-law's tongue. And now I'm sure there's great jokes in there, but my mother-in-law is a member of the congregation, so I couldn't say any. Um, but I got this from Crystal's office. She let me borrow it. And look, it has this little thing in here that you can pull out and you can put water in there. And that's all you got to do. You just put water in there, and this is made for those people that don't have a green thumb. Uh, but So whenever we're planting things, what do you have to do to make a plant grow like this? It starts with a, a seed, and then you put the seed in the, in the dirt and the soil and everything, and then, and then what do you do? You water it, where it gets some sunlight. Okay, so we have to do some things to make that happen, but how does that seed grow? I mean, we don't actually do anything to make that seed grow, right? All of a sudden, it just like burst open, and then it starts to come forward, and then the sprout kind of shoots up, and then all of a sudden, it starts to make whatever plant it is come out. And I, I think, you know, we participate in it, but God's the one that makes this amazing thing happen. And then life comes forth from this seed that's planted in the earth. And today, we're going to be talking about the presence of God with us right now, and, and how, how that happens not only in seeds, but it happens in every single one of us at this very second right now now, and that we get to grow in Christ and in God's kingdom. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for, for mother-in-law tongues and for Father's Day and for seeds and for uh, planting your word on our hearts. Help us to go out into the world to share it with others. In your son's name we pray. Amen. There's a simple phrase that I say on a daily basis. It's four words long, and it helps to keep me in this present moment. Because if you're like me, I start to replay things that have happened in my past, and it creates a lot of anxiety for me. Or I start to participate in future things that have yet to even happen, and I get lost in those as well. And I'm not good in either place, and so I have to come right back down to the right now, the right here in this very moment. And this four-word phrase, you already know it, it's thy will be done. And it helps keep me in the now. And, and to help me do that, I'm a tactile person that I touch my fingers when I say it. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. So do me a favor. Do that with me. Ready? Thy will be done. And I'll tell you how this has worked for me to keep me in this present moment where God has planted me and seeking what God wants for me. I'll tell you about experience that I had recently. So my oldest, Eli, graduated high school. And one of the things that this child wanted to do was go on a cruise. And so her graduation gift is a cruise. And so the whole family's going to go on this cruise. And we had it all set up. And we set the date and everything that fit everybody's calendar. So this summer, that's what we're going to do for our vacation is go on this cruise. I was talking to another friend who was sending his kids off to, on a vacation across the seas. And he's like, yeah, we had to go get passports and it took forever to go get them. And I was like, oh, we're going to need passports for our cruise. And so I look online and it says it's going to take eight weeks to get passports. And there's seven weeks till our cruise. And I'm like, oh, no, that's not good. So I have to get these, these expedited. And so I go through all this paperwork to get things expedited. And it says, go to this post office at this time so they can... Prove that you are who you say you are, sign off on everything, and then it'll mail off, and then your, your passports will come to you. So we had to get kids out of school uh, um, while this was going on, and Becca had to take time off at work, and we all show up, three different cars at the post office. We walk in, and there's a sign on the front door that says, no passport uh, uh, services today. But I ignored that sign, and we kept walking in, and I saw the next sign on the next window that says, no passport stuff today. And it was like, oh, well, we'll just go in line, because after all, I am Pastor Steve, right? And, uh, and, and so I'm thinking, we're going to will this thing to happen. And, and I walk up to the front line, and, and, and I say, we're here to get our passports verified. And they said, there's, did you not see the signs? And I said, yeah, I saw the signs. Well, there's nobody here, and good luck finding anyone, because we're short-staffed right now. And I felt all of the fear of the future well up inside of me. All of a sudden, I saw my child, Eli, 
leave and never turn around and hate me forever and the cruise wasn't going to happen and all was gone and I had ruined our vacation, I'd ruined our summer and in the middle of the Henderson Pass post office, I start crying uncontrolled, but just crying and God bless my wife, she sat there and just let me, you know, and, uh, and in the middle of this, I found myself saying, thy will be done, thy will be done, thy will be done. I don't know what to do right now. I don't know what to do. I'm at a loss. God, please help me. I don't know what to do. I'm caught in the future. I'm caught in all this stuff. Thy will be done. And we walked and talked back to the, to the post people, and, and they said, you know, you could always go to Houston. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> you can get, your, po- you can get, your, <laughs> you can get your passport done in a day there. So, well, that's an option. I don't, nobody wants to drive to Houston for a day. Um, and, but then they also said, you know, there's, maybe there's other post office. There's also a passport agency in San Antonio. And so I go online and set an appointment with the passport agency. And, uh, and we go home. And then we have to take time off of work again, get the kids out of school again. And we all meet up together with three different cars at the passport agency. And I'm walking in holding our folder that has everything in it that proves that we're real, you know. And uh, I walk up to the counter and I feel myself start to shake again. And I'm starting to feel this fear well up inside of me. And I'm starting to feel those same emotions. And I'm like, oh my gosh, am I going to start crying to the passport agency? You know, and we hand these folders over and all the paperwork over to this guy. And he says, why don't you go have a seat? I'll be back in 15 minutes. And we sit down and my family is just cutting up and having the greatest time. And I'm about to lose it again. And I'm texting my spiritual advisor, dude, I'm just like an emotional wreck right now. What's going on? He's like, I'm praying for divine affirmation. Just ask what God wants of you right now. And I'm like, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Just let me be in this present moment right now. I know I can be okay in this moment. Right now I can be okay in this moment. And the guy calls us up to the counter and he says, raise your hands. In two weeks it's going to come. And, and so prayerfully this week or early next week we'll have our passports. I'll let you know. <laughs> so I come back to church because it was a work day. And I come back and I tell the staff this story. And, and Crystal, God bless her, she walks up to me and says, oh, Pastor Steve, you don't need a passport to go on a cruise. You just need your birth certificate. I was like, oh, my God. Thy will be done. <laughs> Thy will be done. This is a beautiful phrase, and, and you're welcome to use that. It's something for me that I use on a daily basis. But it's given to us by Jesus in the Lord's Prayer. And he tells his disciples this is how they are to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be his name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. We're asking for God's kingdom to come. We're asking for God's will to be done. Where? Here. On earth, right now, in this moment, because it's available to us right now. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, just like it is in heaven. See, the thing is, this is something that God's been trying to get to us forever and ever and ever. From the beginning, when it all started in this beautiful garden scene, this, that, that God created everything and invited us to participate in this beautiful creation, it was a garden. It was this beautiful little landscape, and they were going to share in everything. And we call it paradise because the Greek word for garden is paradisio. So we consider this to be like paradise. And so we were in this place, and we found out last week that we got kicked out because we started seeking our own will instead of God's will. And so then we were, we were left out of this garden place, and forever after that, the whole biblical narrative is God saying, my kingdom's available to you. My will is available to you. Turn back toward me. Turn back to this relationship. He did so with Noah and the flood. He did with all the kings and all the judges. They all had the same message. Turn back to God. He did so with Moses. And then Moses gave the Ten Commandments. They're all about our relationship with God and with each other. To turn back toward God. To turn back to this kingdom that is available to us right now. To seek God's will right now. He did it with all the prophets throughout the exile. All of them saying, turn back to God. God's kingdom is available right now with us. And we couldn't get it. So God sends Jesus to intercede on our behalf because we just can't do it. Left to our own devices, we will always choose our will. So Jesus comes onto the scene in the most amazing time because the Roman Empire had all the power. They were in charge. And they ruled by force. In fact, they said, we're going to give you peace by going to war. We're going to give you peace by lording over you. We're going to give you peace through force and through power. And so people understood that concept, that you used power to get something, you used force to get something, you used war to get something. And so they were waiting for a Messiah to come that was going to do just that. 
was going to show force over these Roman oppressors to find that sense of peace. But along comes this itinerant rabbi preacher, Jesus. And he shows up on the scene, and he begins to teach them, but not like the way everybody else taught. See, they, they, they had teachers that taught religion, and they taught ethics, and they taught morality, and they taught all kinds of things for people to do. But Jesus comes in, and he teaches with parables. Now, parables are a really interesting way to teach. But he's doing this because a parable is a way to open your mind to think about something differently. Because they were caught up in the worldview of power, and he's trying to open their mind to look at it differently. Most of the parables have to deal with some sort of agricultural theme, some sort of land, some sort of farming, some sort of garden, pointing back to paradise, pointing back to the garden. And practically all of them say, with what shall we compare the kingdom of God? And they're all talking about how to access the kingdom of God right now. And all these parables have three things that they usually do. And, and, the, and the first one is that the parable usually talks about something uh, very, very small, insignificant, that turns into something very, very large, like yeast in a measure of dough. Boop, you know, and it gets really, really large, and you can't see it happening, but it's going there. It's doing that. Another ways that the parable are used, it talks about the upside-down nature of God's kingdom. It's not like the kingdom of this world. It's upside-down. And in, in, in this type of kingdom, the rich uh, become poor, the poor become rich, the lowly are lifted, you know, that type of thing. But it also talks about the equality of it all, like the parable of the man that, that's looking for workers in his vineyard, and he goes and he gets some, and the next hour he gets another, the next hour he gets another, and at the end of the day, they're all paid the same. So it's this upside-down understanding of, of God's kingdom. And the last one, the last way a parable is used is to talk about how we have a decision to make to participate in this kingdom. And the best example of this is, the, is the, uh, the guy that owns this garden area, and he ends up going away, and he, and he puts somebody in charge, and he sends a servant back to check on it, and they kill the servant. He sends another servant back, and they kill that servant, and then he sends his son, and they kill his son. We have a part to play in this. Are we going to choose ourselves? or are we going to choose God's kingdom? And so today Jesus is sitting with a group of people, and he tells them a parable of a mustard seed. And for those people that aren't ready to have their minds opened, aren't opening up the imagination of this, they're listening to him in the thought process of the day of power and of earthly kingdoms, and they're thinking, why are you talking like this? Because he's almost quoting Ezekiel, what we just read, which talks about this giant Lebanon cedar. Why aren't you talking about a giant tree, not a shrub? Nobody's excited about a shrub. Nobody comes to your house and says, oh, nice shrubs. That doesn't happen. He's like, why aren't, they talk why aren't you talking about the giant Lebanon cedar? Why aren't you talking about the mighty oak? Why aren't you talking about the redwoods of John Muir? Why aren't you talking about the huge aspen grove? Something large. That should be explaining God's kingdom. But that's not what Jesus is doing. And so they can't comprehend it. But for those whose imaginations are starting to open up a little bit and see the upside downness of God's kingdom, to see that small seed of what it truly is, they can hear what he's saying. And the thing of the matter is, is that the mustard seed is not the smallest of all seeds, is it? We know it's not the smallest of all seeds. You've been to HEB, you've gone down the spice aisle, they have mustard seeds in a jar. It's not the smallest seed in H-E-B, right? So it's clearly not the smallest seed. So something else is going on here. And then the mustard bush that comes out, it's not some regal bush. It's just a bush. And in fact, it, 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 it chokes out other plants that are around it. It's an annual, which means it's going to bloom every year, producing more seed that's going to go everywhere. It's uncontrollable. You have to, like, fight to keep it out of the garden. In other words, what Jesus is looking at these people is saying that the kingdom of God is like an everyday, ordinary thing that can produce mess. And it can go everywhere. And it's so much so that, yes, even the birds of the air, God's creatures will find a place to be in it from the very ordinary. Jesus is asking them to open their minds to understand the kingdom of God in a new way and that it's available right now. Now, maybe you're like me and you find yourself crying in a post office, whatever. 
God's kingdom's available right now. It's everywhere, all around us. It's in the everyday, ordinary things. And it's available to all. It's all around us, like an infectious weed everywhere, growing. Am I going to participate in it? Am I going to make that decision to participate in it? Am I really going to ask for God's will to be done? That's the hard part. A lot of times I do that when things aren't going my way, when I'm stuck in the past or I'm stuck in the future and I just want things to kind of calm down. But God says it's available all the time. The kingdom of God is available right now on earth as in heaven. And it's easily accessible to every single one of us. All we need to do is seek God's will. What will you have me be today? Thy will be done. Amen.